Hey guys, David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. I hope you're all doing well. This is episode 101. You could potentially think of it as season two of the David Gray Rehab podcast, but I don't think it's a good idea to label it as season two because then no one will go back and listen to season one if I did call it that. So we're just going to keep rolling. It's just going to be one long, longest season of all time. No splitting up into different seasons. Um, I'm going to do a solo podcast today. I have three questions to answer for you guys. Um, One, I'll read them very quickly now and then we'll kind of go from there so one is from ashley when someone has a structural issue um that will limit range slash function how do you know when you've hit the limit of what they're capable of due to the structural issue another one is as a physio i'm really struggling to learn strength and conditioning do you have any advice and then another one is i'm trying to build out a successful clinic and struggling with the vision do you have frameworks for helping with decision making and direction those are the three topics I'm going to try and cover today. I don't think we'll be too long covering them. But then again, I do say that a lot and I end up rambling on for ages. <laughs> so we'll see how we go. Um, little bit of a life update. I am nice and fresh today. Um, we, Me and Kira got a really good night's sleep last night. We had been really struggling with Matthew. We were just... I don't know, not doing things right <laughs> or well enough or whatever. And um, he got a little bit of like a sniffly nose. I don't know. Did I speak about this on the podcast? He got like a, a he got a bit sick and basically we couldn't lie him on his back for three or four days at all. So like at 24 hours of the day, he, uh, Kira or I had to have him in our arms. He got sick a few times, like projectile vomit. <laughs> um from the bottles and stuff and yeah we were just kind of like at a point where we were very confused in terms of like what do we do here are we feeding him enough are we not feeding him are we feeding him too much like how do we get him down we're ending up feeding him constantly rather than having breaks and stuff in between but last night we got a knock on the door at 8 p.m last night and it was my uh two aunties two of my mom's sisters rocked in with their bags and they said we're de- we hadn't spoken to them uh they said we're down for the night you guys can go to bed <laughs> so they rocked in and they were absolutely amazing they uh they spent a couple of hours with us and just talked us through a few things and like he just got the best night's sleep and so did we it's the first time kira and me have slept in a bed together since December because she even before she gave birth she wasn't sleeping in the bed because I was think I was going through a it kicked it off I was snoring for a couple of weeks and uh that agitated her but also she wasn't comfortable in the bed so um so yeah that was amazing and we learned so much from them last night so a few little lessons for anyone who will end up as a parent uh I presume anyone who's listening who already is already knows all this stuff, but we were very, very quick ones, right? One, you just can't beat knowledge and experience. Ask for help (laughs) or get help uh, from people who've done it before. You cannot beat both knowledge and experience. They just knew what they were doing. And we were like, in our minds, we were like, oh, maybe he's just a baby who won't sleep and this and that. And like, it's been he's transformed since they came into the house yesterday so can't beat knowledge experience that's number one number two don't try and cut corners so here's what happened was we were feeding him we were giving him uh like a 70 ml bottle we we're trying to like break it up and burp him and stuff in between so to slow him down but he was feeding and i think a few times i gave it to him too fast and what happened was he ended up uh, not being not feeling like he wasn't full. Then I ended up giving him more because he drank it so fast. Obviously, if you sit down for dinner and you eat something like you eat a meal really, really quickly, you don't actually feel full. You want to have dessert and stuff straight away. So I was giving it to him too fast. Then I was giving he was like getting angry. He was still wanted more because it was over in five minutes. So I'd give him more. Then he'd end up. uh I wouldn't burp him properly, put him down, and he'd end up puking up. So whether I was saving time or just didn't know that I should have been slowing down, uh, what was end up, that would just restart the process again. So I have to pick him up, 
change him and feed him again 20 minutes later. And that went on and on and on. So like you can't cut corners in anything in life. If you do it right, if you do it right, it will save you time in the long run. So now a feed takes, I don't know, half an hour to give him his bottle where you burp him in between. They showed us how to burp him properly. I was like getting up the crappiest little burps. Um, my auntie came in, put him in a position, rubbed him in a few, like a few times in a certain way. And next thing it was big belches coming up. Uh, and then they were able to feed him more, like feed him enough. It wasn't that I was overfeeding him. It was just that I was feeding him uh, too fast and not burping him well enough. So like knowledge and experience, don't cut corners. And the last one is you can't beat a woman's touch. I've seen there's been men come into the house, including me, other men, and like they do their best, but they're just awkward with a baby. Not all men, of course, but like, I don't know, there's something to do with a woman's touch. I learned that when I was 15 years of age <laughs> and I haven't forgotten it. There's something special about a woman's touch. So, um, so uh, yeah, uh, us, us men, we try our best. We really try our best, but where there's a bit of an instinct that I think might be missing. So those are my lessons. And um, I'm in very good form today because we got probably six or seven hours, maybe even more sleep last night. And more importantly, it does feel like I didn't mind the work with him all along. It was just not knowing what I was doing. That was the frustrating part. Like I would do the work, I would, but I just didn't know. I had no clarity around it. So clarity, clarity is, I think, really important. So first question from Ashley Lewis. Um, this came in on YouTube. Thank you, everyone on YouTube, for all the comments over the last few videos. Let's keep that going. Um, I've been really enjoying reading the comments. So thank you so much. And it's nice for Ashley there to ask a question. I, I kind of have that store there and I can just pick it up and do it, answer it on the next uh, podcast. So please make sure that you uh, drop a, a question there because I get questions in my DMs all the time. Sometimes I screenshot them. Sometimes I take them. I have a little note section, uh, not a little, a huge note section in my um, on my phone. Oh, I have all dirt on my uh, hand. Kira did tell me to wash that off, but I didn't. Um, I have a note section with a po all the podcast stuff in my phone, but then kind of stuff kind of gets a bit lost or I scroll past it or I write more notes or something from questions that I get. So leave a comment on YouTube. Um, that's a nice place to leave it. And I'll try and answer it then on the following podcast or one of the following podcasts. So Ashley, uh, appreciate the question. Uh, shout out to Ashley. Actually, he is... He has been very much engaging with our content, our programs, DJ Interactive, our podcasts, comments on Instagram and all that stuff for several months now. And it hasn't, I don't know, sometimes people ask me like about networking and stuff like that. Like, are you actually engaged? Obviously, he's interested in the material. Like, are you actually engaging in with the people that you are interested in? Uh, that's a great way of networking. Like I have never, I've had a couple of small short DM conversations with Ashley, but I know, I, I, I know his name very well. Now I respect him because he's asked good questions. He's commented over a period of time. He's showed an interest and like, you're going to kind of look after people that do that more. So are you actually engaging with people or are you hiding in the background? Don't be afraid to, I'm not just saying with me, I would love if you engaged with more of our content because it's just, it's just feedback. It's just nice. Like forget about the algorithm stuff. It's just nice when you're getting feedback from real people. And it's also like other people, I bet you Ashley's gotten loads of followers from commenting on my page and other people's page because he's commenting interesting stuff and people will go then and find it and so on and so forth. Uh, there's Kira. Hello, Kira. Wave to everyone. <laughs> this is why I need a new office. But um, okay, so Ashley's question is when someone has a structural issue, uh, OA or joint replacement, for example, uh, that will limit range slash function. How do you know when you've hit the limit of what they're capable of due to the structural issue? Um, good question, Ash. So there's a few ways we can go about this. How do you know how do you know? Uh, how do you know when you've hit the limit? Um, so, guess what, Ash? All of us have a structural issue. We all do because, and I don't mean oh, everyone has a degree of scoliosis or everyone has this or that. No, we all have a structural issue. We will all hit our limit at some stage. If I keep 
hyperextending or extending my elbow and hyperextending further and further and further, eventually I'm going to hit a block or else it's going to pop and it's going to burst out of my skin. So I have a structural issue uh, and I know my body tells me when I've hit end range. These people, they have a structural issue. Their body will tell them when they've hit end range. It will just tell them it will just happen sooner rather than later for these type of structural issues so don't treat it too differently to anyone else look at the range that seems to be available to them and train that range that's what i would say i think it's it's quite a simple answer to be honest now what you shouldn't do is trust someone when they say like okay I can only move my shoulder this amount or I can only move my hip this amount because I have arthritis or because someone has told me I need a hip replacement or because I've had a hip replacement or blah, 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 blah. Don't trust them entirely when they say that because you will often see people say that and what is actually limiting them is yes at some stage the joint is going to limit them they will hit a block at some stage where they literally cannot go further but where they are right now is not that stage because it's uh their body knows that block is there or intellectually they know that structurally like i'm limited and what they've done is layer on a ton of muscular tension uh way before that end range and protective tone way before that end range so now they're hitting that block way sooner than they actually could be so what i try and 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 i speak to clients about this a lot of the time clients will be very sometimes very upset especially when it comes to uh their back their spine like someone has told me i'll never be able to move through that area again or my ankle is has some kind of limitation it's never going to be able to move in x y and z way again um or my big toe or whatever and i'll just try and frame it in a couple of ways one let's not try to predict the future here we don't know what is possible or capable your your body is capable of i've seen a lot of cool stuff where people have been told a lot of things and it has changed over time uh so we won't try and predict the future but let's think about what we would do what 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 would we do to help you feel better in the short term medium term just to help you feel better and train you to be better uh if we didn't know that you had a structural issue what would what would i do with my client personally i wouldn't regardless of if i if i thought they had a structural issue or not i wouldn't push their end ranges aggressively i would help them smooth out the range that they have access to in a way that feels nice nice doesn't need to mean easy nice can mean hard like it can be a very difficult movement movement we can load them um but i'm just not being aggressive in their end ranges where i'm trying to force them or they force themselves to push into end range it should still feel like and when i say nice like that's a nice contraction that's a nice stretch that's a nice movement for me there's none of this like oh uh, that i'm really not sure about that range there let's just leave that kind of oh unsure feeling for a little while so whether someone has a structural issue or not i'm probably training them in the range that they're relatively comfortable in in a nice way nice again doesn't mean easy it can be very difficult but in a way that is we're clear this is not hopefully not causing aggravation here so regardless of if they have a structural issue or not clean up the range that they have access to make them stronger in that range make them more comfortable in that range make them help them sense that range much better help them perceive those ranges much better so they're very clear about what's happening as they move from one end of that range to the other end of that range in that joint and in surrounding joints and you might be surprised that over time structurally uh, over time they will open up range but you haven't gone searching for it that much you haven't pushed it that much uh the body will grant you range as it feels like you're being respectful to it and you're being safe and you're building strength. So um, how do you know if you've hit the limit? Sometimes it's very obvious. I have hair sticking up on the back of my head. Sometimes it's very obvious that you've hit the limit. I had a client once, uh, you've all had clients like this, but one guy stands out in my mind uh, very much so. He was an active guy. He was doing cycling uh, or 
playing cycling. He was cycling a lot and playing tennis and stuff like that. And he came into me and he said, a surgeon told me I needed a hip replacement. Uh, my hip has been in a lot of pain and like I'm really struggling to like get onto the bike and do a lot of different movements and I wouldn't take a, a surgeon's word as gospel by any in any way shape or form I also wouldn't automatically say like you see a lot of people on social media or whatever saying like oh that's bullshit they just want to cut you no some yeah maybe some of them do but like Let's take an expert's advice and take it as an important piece of information here. Let's not just disregard this. So he um, he came in and he said that, yeah, so the surgeon said this and I was all set. And then there's a guy in Ireland who will remain nameless, but he puts up a lot of social media content and he basically promises people that they will be fixed in the session, in the one session. And he puts up videos, like a camera in the client's face in the first session. And they say, I had osteitis pubis for two years and this guy just fixed me in this session, which is the biggest load of bullshit in history because how do you know you fixed anyone in the one session? <laughs> because it's it's the next day and the next week and the next month and as they ramp up the load and blah, 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 that's when you know if you have quote unquote fixed an issue or not. Not when someone is standing there after just getting two hours of a session with you. That is not the time to stick a camera in someone's face. If you look at my testimonials that I put up from people, it's almost always people saying, like, are are us saying this was developed over time. Yes, I I I might say, I might put up a testimonial of someone that says like Jesus, I've been doing lower, lower body basics and my hips feel so much better after just a week. But we're, I, I, I'm just putting up like a screenshot of that or whatever. I'm not saying or they're not saying like this is transformed in 24 hours. If someone, if someone sent me a, a testimonial, I get them all the time actually. Like I just did 10 minutes of lower body basics and my pain is gone. I'm not putting up that I'm it's very unlikely maybe the right screenshot but very unlikely that I'm putting up that testimonial because I know that this this it's it's just as likely that they will take they will write to me a few days later and say my pain is back so uh anyway back to the story so this guy he was all set he was going to get a, a hip replacement then he saw this guy on social media went up to him the guy said no no you don't need it like I can fix your hip problem it's just a a myofascial sling problem or something and I can fix that in this session and here's your exercises and like his pain got worse I put him on the table had a look at him he had like 10 degrees of hip flexion anything after that he went into a huge amount of hip abduction there was like a a jerking like don't get me wrong not uh, noise noise within a hip uh, any joint is not necessarily an issue but it was like a a a massive clunking as I tried to help him go further associated with a lot of pain and associated with like just a zero movement at the hip into flexion it was just abduction he had 10 degrees of hip flexion I'm not saying I'm not uh I'm not the person that should be able to tell someone you need a hip replacement or anything like that. I would never say that to someone, but I had a conversation with him and and we tried some movements and stuff. And like, it was fairly egregious what was happening. And I said, like, I think you should go back to that surgeon and have a, or another surgeon and get another opinion. Clearly what you've been given from this other person, I think you've been misled here. And um, I think you need to, like he was happy with the decision previously of, of about getting a hip replacement. I've seen clients that have gotten hip replacements that people have been so adamant. You don't need it. You don't need it. I can fix you. Do your glute strength and stuff. Like, I, I don't know, like surgery. I'm so happy to live in a world where surgeons are amazing at what they do. I've seen a lot of people like have gotten hip replacements and stuff. They Their quality of life is 10 times better after it than before it um so it's not it's not the end of the world so so yeah he went back to the the surgeon he got his hip replacement he felt way better he could get back on the bike and back playing tennis and all of those things so uh structural issues i'm gone off topic ash because i know you didn't ask that but like sometimes that is the right option okay it just depends on on the person but basically i think to summarize don't try and predict where their end range is based on a diagnosis. Um, try to 
take the person as they come. Try to treat them as another normal person where be respectful of end ranges no matter who they are. It's just that you're aware that these end ranges are going to be happening much sooner. Of course, if there's uh, structural issues, pathologies and stuff like that, you need to be aware of what, excuse me, of what they, those are as well along the way. And how do you know when you've hit the limit? It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter. Don't, because you shouldn't try and predict where the limit is. You shouldn't try and predict where your client, to tell your client where the limit is. You should just train them with what they've got and that might open up over time. So I actually don't think it matters. You shouldn't be promising them, oh, I can promise you you're going to get another 20 degrees of flexion or internal rotation or whatever. Don't promise that. Just say, here's what you've got. Uh, yeah, back, sorry, back to my back to the original kind of point that I was trying to make. If I was talking to a client and they were like, could I, can I get more out of this? Uh, like, it's kind of an awkward question because the answer is maybe you can, but also maybe you can't. So if you're, if you're purely judging it on like, can I get more range of motion out of this, then you're potentially setting someone up for a fall and you're setting their expectations in a way that means they're hanging their hat in, entirely on just can I get more range or not so I would prefer to reframe that conversation and say uh, I am not going to predict what you can get I often see that people can get more than they think they can I think obviously you're not I, and this is kind of a conversation I have obviously you're never going to end up as a contortionist you're probably not going to do the splits but we don't need to be able to do that I don't want to predict how far it can go I just want to take you as you are right now and let's improve your whatever we're trying to improve in the ranges that we have access to. Be respectful. And I think that this could open up a little more over time. But you know what? Even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because I wouldn't do anything differently. What I would do based on if you have potential access to another 20 degrees or potential access to another zero degrees, I would train you in the same way. So let's focus on being trained in the same way, which means let's get a bit stronger. Let's get more comfortable within the ranges that we are in, that we have access to. Let's uh, get very clear about the ranges that we have access to. When I'm trying to move your hip, we want to move your hip just because um just because you don't have access to 90 degrees of hip flexion that's no excuse for you when you're moving through uh zero to 60 degrees of hip flexion you actually don't move your hip in those ranges either it's your spine that's causing an orientation and causing your hip to move so let's actually be clear on really smoothing it out the range that you do have access to and training that over time it will either open up or not but the good thing is no matter what which of those you will be better in the range that you have access to so let's not try and play god or uh nostradamus or whatever his name is work with what you've got it will either open up over time or it won't but you're going to be better regardless because we're going to train you in a really smart way so i hope that answers your question ash and i do have that conversation constantly with clients who are sometimes really down about oh this toe has arthritis and i can't uh, limit this and i can't open it up let's just let's just tackle what's in front of us right now be respectful and i i'm pretty sure you can feel way better than you feel Maybe the range will open over time. Maybe it won't. But I, I think it won't even matter that much because you're going to end up feeling so good and so much stronger and so on. So that's a way of being honest with people. Um, that's a way of not causing delusion like I spoke about in a previous podcast. And it's a way of having a slightly optimistic and realistic approach to what's happening, uh, not selling them a pipe dream but still making sure that they would maintain unwavering faith that they're going to be pretty good. Okay. Um, next question. Um, Ash, let me know in the, in this YouTube video, if that, uh, if you have any follow-up questions or if that is helpful. Uh, next question. As a physio, I'm really struggling to learn strength and conditioning. Do you have any advice? Um, so when most 
people say I'm trying they're trying to learn strength and conditioning I think what they mean is the programming side of things especially in the physio world I think like that conversation happens all the time uh it's a good conversation I I'm I'm really happy that uh the ter- therapy therapy world is moving more towards trying to get better at the SNC side of things um that's a really important evolution for the rehab and the therapy worlds uh, really really important but usually what people mean i don't know what this person means but usually what people mean when they say that it's the programming and what you can what i think is the programming is the easiest part of it by far of snc if you think about like a true snc coach they're potentially working with teams um there's and and, and there's a lot of uh difficulties that can come along with that they're working with teams let's say they are trying to understand the logistics of okay i have all these different types of players different buckets different schedules to work around different uh ways i need to communicate different hours like just all different kinds of stuff so many like balls to juggle as a true strength and conditioning coach so don't get me wrong when i say this snc is very 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 difficult i have gone into an snc role for a professional team in the past and like i didn't do a great job to be honest i learned a lot from it i took it because i wasn't ready but i was ready to learn so i did learn a lot from it um i know some sncs that are operating at the top the the toppest the, the highest or the top level of sport um i'm actually helping out a couple of them at the moment with their own bodies and I have so much respect for what they do. I wouldn't be able to do what they do. Uh, so S strength, being a strength and conditioning coach is not easy. But the programming side of things on an individual basis, the programming for a team can be quite difficult, especially when you have so many other, like you have games coming up and you have different types of players and different injuries and blah, blah, blah to work around and logistics of maybe having enough equipment or too much or not enough space. That is difficult. Um, and then coordinate with management and all that stuff. That is difficult. But the programming, usually when a physio says, I'm trying to learn the strength and conditioning side of things, what they mean is I'm trying to learn how to write a program for a one-off person and progress a program. And what I will say is that is really, 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 really easy. It's not difficult whatsoever. Usually physios or te- rehab people feel inadequate about that side of things because they're reading books and they're looking at things and they're seeing strength and conditioning coaches talking about periodization uh, principles and they're writing out fancy spreadsheets that plan out the next 12 months and it's all color coded and it's all percentages and it's all of this stuff. You can be safe in the knowledge that that stuff does not work and is not applicable to i'm going to round up to a whole number here 100 percent of the population if i was to keep it at a decimal point i would put it at 99.9 percent of the population that periodization model does not work you should look into john coyley's work for a little bit of that um where he where he talks about kind of just some of the myths around periodization but not just his work it's just common sense especially for someone operating in the rehab space that works even less because rehab is about solving problems as they come up anyone can just like get a sheet of paper and have an acl rehab planned out for the next 12 months like that's cool to be able to do that and that is useful to be able to do that to think about just for you not not for the client maybe to show the client like ideal world this is what it might look like but like that's never going to happen uh so you can be safe in the knowledge that that stuff doesn't actually work so when you're asking about learning strength and conditioning what you're asking what i think you're probably asking because you're not going to be doing all the other stuff of strength and conditioning you're just going to be doing the programming side of it really what really matters for the programming side of it is being very clear on the objectives of the program understanding like how adaptations occur and um understanding how people progress over time and then just being really really clear so what i would say and i probably spoke about this on one of the last podcasts not the last one in the last three or four podcasts i did speak about programming a little bit i can't remember what the example was oh yeah i spoke about like the difference between 
a rehab like a uh, minimal effective dose and kind of maximal optimal dose for a pro athlete versus someone else so he kind of spoke about this already but what i would say is think about let's put a constraint on you you're working with a client and i'm going to say to you you're only allowed use three exercises this week to help this person start your programming with that in mind three exercises that's all you're allowed uh, i'm not saying how much my hair is sticking up again i'm not saying how much you or little you can do of them we'll talk about that afterwards but three exercises that's all you're allowed what are you choosing that's a good place to start what are you choosing what three exercises now we can talk about like why did you choose those and now if you were only allowed to choose three exercises you would that that would automatically mean that the client that you have is probably going to place all of their intent on those three exercises and do them really well in terms of do them with uh the right form that you are trying to elicit within the exercise they're going to try and perform it the way you want it to be done because they have their energy focused on that they're going to try and perform it with a certain amount of intensity and intention uh but intensity more than anything because they they do they're only allowed to do three exercises they and a certain and we're going to limit the sets and reps in a minute as well but uh they're going to do three exercises for a certain amount of sets and reps. So they don't want to undershoot it, which is going to be like an important thing to teach them not to undershoot it. So you're, you're given three exercises, which means that they're probably going to do them in the right way, which means that they're probably going to do them. And the right way depends on what you're trying to get from it. Um, they're probably going to do them with the right amount of intensity. And then you can easily just play around with the volume, uh, sets and reps or less frequency from there. So, if you can get that right in the rehab world, that's going to give you, honestly, 80% of your results. From there, you can start to think about filling in the rest of the program um, for the week. I'm just talking about a week here. Um, you can start to fill in the rest of the program where you can put in other exercises around it. But anything that you add in from there should not take away from the key three exercises that you're going to do if you had a late stage hamstring rehab i would suggest that one of those exercises was a sprint some kind of a sprint it could be uh like an acceleration 10 or 15 meters uh six to ten reps on a tuesday six to ten reps on a, of a friday uh it could be like a linear day on a tuesday and a and a change of direction day on a friday so what are the three key exercises if you could only do three exercises on the tuesday and you can only do another three on the friday the linear day what three are you going to choose you could potentially think okay let's separate a warm-up obviously you need to get warm which is like just get warm what three are you going to use maybe for someone who doesn't switch particularly well you might choose some kind of like a skip or something like that trying to get some intent into switching um maybe you will choose uh for someone that needs a little bit more discipline in their spine maybe you'll choose like a dribble an ankle dribble a calf dribble or a knee dribble or something like this so that they and and, and the intent here is like okay let's stay I, I, not brace through the spine but let's tra let's let's keep control over our trunk here so you could have one of those uh you could have uh, a scissor bleed where they're uh scissoring out in front of them they're still getting a little bit of switching there so you're scissoring out in front like a straight knee scissor bleed uh bleeding into a run or a sprint and then you could have a sprint um i'm saying this do not write this as a program for someone. This is an example. So don't go and tear someone's hamstring doing this. But uh, next thing, you could have a sprint. Uh, four reps of 40-meter sprint. Uh, take two to four minutes in between. And then uh, take 10 minutes in between the first set. So you've done four with two minutes or three minutes or four minutes in between each sprint take 10 minutes rest in between where maybe if they're a soccer player kick a ball for 10 minutes if they're a hurler or rugby player catch a ball throw a ball just mess around for 10 minutes then we're going to come back 
and do four more sprints. There's our three key exercises for that Tuesday. If you do, do those three right, I know I talk about a few different ones, but let's just say I spoke spoke about three. If you do those three right with the right intention, the right intensity, um, and the right everything else around it, then fill in the fill in the gaps. It doesn't matter. Uh, fill in the gaps. It really doesn't matter. That's a good you have chosen the, the the thing that might be the get all their gains to be honest that you might get all their gains just from doing that uh let's go to the friday okay friday we're going to do um we're going to have a focus on like moving laterally or change of direction so again let's have a warm-up there um what do we want we want to have a, a lateral movement maybe we can have uh, jab step where they're doing a jab step for 20 meters or 10 meters uh, moving from right to left and then back from left to right so this is teaching them to plant their foot and push away um these are just examples these are just examples you could have a uh, like a five cone agility drill or a lateral shuffle. So you've moved from like just planting this one foot all the time and pushing away to having to actually plant or let's, I'm going to keep it more simple. Let's not choose a a five cone agility drill. Let's say we chose a jab step into a lateral shuffle. And then we're going to choose a lateral shuffle into a sprint. I shuffle five meters. I hit the cone and I sprint. No, actually I'm going to keep it purely more change of direction. I shuffle for five meters, I hit the cone, and then I do a kind of a sprinting, a curved sprint for 20 meters. We're going to do eight reps of that. Uh, Amazing. We've just done three drills, a jab step, a lateral shuffle into, uh, did I have a third drill? A lateral shuffle, maybe? Did I say that? And then a lateral shuffle into a curved run or a curved sprint. So I, I shuffle to the cone, I plant my foot, I have a, some kind of a curve. It could be a sharp curve. It could be different curves, whatever it could be. And I sprint the curve for 20 meters or something like that. Tuesday and Friday, late stage hamstring rehab. Hammer those things. Do them so incredibly well. Get the right amount of intensity. When I'm saying sprinting, maybe we're just doing those sprinting drills at like a 70%, 75, 80% intensity. So let's take it to ne- next week. Let's say that this week, week one, well, it wouldn't be week one, but I'm just going to call it week one. You have just done that at 75% with that person. Hopefully you can do some of the other drills at 100%, but this, the end uh, drill, the sprinting drill at the end on the Tuesday and the Friday, you're going to do it at 75%. How would you logically progress that the next week? I wouldn't probably think about adding on more sets and reps. You could do that as well. I would be more keen, especially in rehab where you're kind of trying to push a timeline. Let's let's go at 80%. That's a logical progression. Like that's that's strength and conditioning, what you're doing there. I'm just talking about it with it on the pitch. If it was in the gym, you did a, a back squat for five reps this week at 80 kilos. Maybe we can do five reps at 85 kilos. Uh, that's That's strength and conditioning. This is the programming side of it. Anything else that you put around those two, let's just keep it with the pitch sessions. Maybe you have some other drills beforehand. Maybe you have some plyometrics beforehand or plyometrics afterwards. That's fine. That's the, that, that's, that can make it a really well-rounded program. But be clear, if you are only allowed to use three exercises, start with that in mind. What are the, maybe even think about it two exercises or one exercise what is the one that you're going to do that's going to give you your 80 percent of your gains start with that in mind that is how you do a good rehab and personally that is how you do a good strength and conditioning program i wonder how many people that talk about the amazing results that their client got uh in with their strength and conditioning program and they and they have all this all this everything and it looks amazing like probably especially in rehab, especially in rehab, probably most of their gains came from a few small things and the rest were, I won't say fluff. I don't want to say fluff because the rest can uh, enhance the training experience and give them the variety that they maybe need. But like sometimes you just need to do a few things really well. So the question was, as a physio, I'm really struggling to learn strength and conditioning. Do you have any advice? One, like maybe you could go and learn from a good strength and conditioning coach. That's a good idea. Um, but hopefully, 
yeah, learn from a good strength and conditioning coach. Like that is obviously like the best, uh, the best thing that you could do. But a good strength and conditioning coach is going to kind of do what I just ex- described there. They're going to be very clear on what the intention of the session is. And they're just going to be clear in a logical way of how, how they're going to progress that from week to week. So, um, the way I went around answering this question was kind of by saying that learning strength and conditioning programming principles is so, so incredibly simple and that you can be pretty safe in the knowledge that the fancy periodization models that make you feel like you are inadequate when it comes to strength and conditioning, they actually don't even work in the first place. They are just a lot of the time mental masturbation. So uh, that is my answer there. I hope that is helpful. I hope people don't misconstrue that or make it seem like I'm saying strength and conditioning is an easy job. I am not saying that. It is absolutely not an easy job. It is not an impossible job, just like rehab is not an easy job, but it's not that hard either. Um, I'm just saying that to do it well it's not it's not that difficult to do parts of it well the there's other parts that are dif- more difficult to do well the last question um let me take a sip i actually have a coffee there that i haven't drank yet this is water by the way <laughs> if people think i've gone mad this is now coffee i've been drinking a lot of coffee recently I did have a 2 p.m. rule, no coffee after 2 p.m. Um, but uh, that's gone out the window because <laughs> it doesn't matter because I'm not going to be going to sleep anyway. So uh, last question. I'm trying to build out a successful clinic and struggling with the vision. Do you have frameworks for helping with decision making and direction? Um, yes and no, but this is this is a bit too broad of a question to to say about frameworks for helping with decision making and direction. I'm trying to build out a successful clinic and struggling with the vision. I can't help you with the vision that much. Uh, I could if we were having a one-to-one conversation, but you need to be clear on the vision. What do you want your clinic to look like? What do you want? Actually, I would start with what do you want your life to look like? I would definitely start there because the clinic needs to be just part of that. You often see people um, modeling, looking at, another person's business and copying that business but if you look at their life would you like to have their life I don't necessarily mean like would you like to be them but would you like to live the life that they are living if the answer is no then it's very likely that you would not also not like to have the business that they have because those things are like it or not, usually inextricably linked. You can't separate them. They created the type of business that they created because they lived their life in a certain way, whether they know that or not. So uh, I would start with what the vision for your life, what you want that to look like, um, and then build out the vision for the clinic because that needs to be part of that. Uh, it's going to be a very big part of your life. The, your life is going to be dictated, the quality of your life is going to be dictated by where you live, who you live with, and what you work on. Those are the three things that are basically going to dictate the quality of your life that you can have an influence on. Of course, there could be uh, circumstances completely out of your control, like you just got hit by a bus that is out of your control but mainly the three biggest decisions that you need to make in your life and you need to really think about these and make them well um, is where you live really important who you live with really fucking important and what you work on really really important if you can get all those three decisions right then you're going to have a healthy happy life so what you work on is only one of three important decisions and that vision needs to be part of all of the other stuff as well. But do you have frameworks for helping with decision-making and direction? Well, I just gave you a framework there, to be honest. Um, I kind of just gave you a framework, but I would say ask yourself, ask yourself 
one simple question here. What do I need to do to deliver a world-class service to the client of my dreams? That's a very simple framework because if you put all your decision-making, all the questions you have, the lack of clarity, the vision that you need, if you put all that through a lens of what do I need to do to deliver a world-class service to the client of my dreams? What that means is you need to actually decide who the client of your dreams is. You don't need to be like in the beginning, you don't need to be so, so, so clear on it. Like, cause you will get more and more clear as you go along, but you should have some idea like, cause it's going to be difficult to deliver a world-class service to the client of your dreams. If the client of your dreams is a, is a, a, a female who just gave birth and you want to help with their pelvic floor stuff, but what's who are who's coming into you is a six-year-old farmer who <laughs> has back pain and uh, they're milking cows for twelve hours a day. The, the world-class service for each of those two people is just going to be very different because they have different expectations and they need different levels of service and so on and so forth. So, I would say it good question to ask yourself is what do I need to do to deliver a world-class service to the client of my dreams it doesn't mean that every single person that comes in the door is going to be the client of your dreams but if you have that one person in mind then you're much more likely to deliver a service that then goes on to attract more of that person if that makes sense so what that then means when that so that's where we've just tried to define the client of your dreams you need to think about who that is think about one person ideally um and if you actually if you only had one client like what would you do for that client i bet you you would you would deliver a world-class service for that client because you need that client to be successful so think about it in that way so we've kind of spoken about the client of your dreams part of that statement that i just made let's think about uh what do i need to do to deliver a world-class service well that actually doesn't just mean what happens within the clinic that means every part of their experience with you which means uh how they if if you have content how they view your content uh is it good is it crap are you talk are you being an idiot on your on your content because you're not going to be delivering a world-class service to someone if their perception of you from the beginning is this fella's a bit of a dick uh that's going to cloud the whole experience think about um who delivers a world-class service let's think about it um let's think about it let's think about an airline um world class is obviously relative to the industry that you're in right but let's think about an airline maybe this isn't a great example but let's think about if you've traveled business class or first class when you go and uh you arrive you arrive at the airport and you need to check in when you see a big massive queue for economy and actually you have a business class ticket, you get to skip the queue. You get to go up to the front. Hopefully you meet uh, someone at the check-in desk who is really happy and really smiley and says, welcome and blah, 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 blah. They take your bags. It takes two minutes. You get the fast track experience through the airport where you don't have to queue at security. You get to go into the lounge, which is the food is unbelievable. Trust me, I've done a couple of business class flights. It is fucking worth it. Um, I won't say it's worth it because that depends, but it is a deadly experience to go into a good a good business class lounge is amazing a good business class class lounge is worth every penny if it's a really good one so if it's a long haul flight so you go into the lounge amazing unbelievable um you get to get first onto the flight which means uh no queuing up there they're really nice to you they help you with their, your bags they sit you down they give you a hot towel they give you a glass of champagne they wait on you hand and foot for the entire flight you get off the flight first you get your bags off the cabin first your bags come out first on the conveyor belt no one ever told me that your bags come out first you're off the plane and you're gone before you're gone with your suitcase that's come off first before other people are even off the plane. It's unbelievable. So every single touch point there should have been amazing if you're with the right airline. So you need to think about, and not just that, hopefully like even they actually don't do this well enough, but hopefully the booking of the flight should even be easier if you're someone that has uh, showed that you are a business class uh, flight person or something like that. I don't know, maybe they do. Kira books all our flights. But think about that 
So think about that. Think about what you can do to deliver a world-class service. That starts with your perception or their perception of you, which starts with your content. It starts with what other people are saying with you. It starts potentially with your website or your booking system when they book in an appointment. And I'm not saying we do all this amazing ourselves, trust me, but we will get there. Uh, We do certain parts are world-class. Our delivery is world-class. Our the coaching side of it is world class. I fundamentally believe that we deliver a better service for certain clients, the right clients for us, better than anyone else in the world. And I don't even believe it's even close, to be honest, in terms of the results that we get. But I want to have every single touch point as being world class. And at the moment, it's not not good enough, but we're, 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 we know what, what our North Star is. So every touch point needs to be amazing. Your content and I'm not saying you're going to do this. Don't don't let this overwhelm you because it's not going to take weeks or months. It's going to take years. It's going to take constant, consistent and constant iteration to get it to this point. But your question was like, what's the framework for decision making? Like that, that should be the framework. What do we need to do to deliver a world class service? And then you just start chipping away on it, on that. Don't, it's like asking, like, what do I need to do to build a 200 kilo squat? Maybe you need to start with a 50 kilo squat. You're still progressing along the way when you have 60 and 70 kilos and 80 kilos. But you know that what, what, what the end goal is, but don't freak out. Don't let that end goal overwhelm you. So your content, your website, when they book in, do they get videos of you? Uh, saying, well, here's what you should expect from your session and here's the directions for the clinic or here's how you get on the Zoom call and maybe here's some content that you can uh, consume in the meantime to help you get more comfortable and set your expectations for the session. When you come into the session, are you late for the session? Um, are they? Are you good at making people comfortable? Are you able to uh, identify and listen to them and assess uh, in a good way? Are you then able to coach them? Are you able to be clear with your communication in terms of here is what we're going to use? Uh, are you going to be? Are you able to send them their homework in a streamlined way that gives them ease of access to the material that they need to access and do it? Are they able to have touch points with you in between the sessions? Um, are they is is the billing is the payment side of things is that easy every single thing is the is the rebooking easy every single thing what do i need to do to deliver a world class service that's the framework when you're building your clinic start to think about that and then start with the lowest hanging fruit number 1 make sure that your delivery is good spend time on product first spend time on product first which means you need to be good at working with clients if you're good at working with clients everything else can be kind of shit and you'll still be fine. If you're bad at working with clients and you make every all the other parts good, like the onboarding and all that, great. But ultimately you're not going to have client retention because they're not going to come back to you and they're not gonna they're not gonna send you more people. And what that means is you're just kind of burning money because you've spent money on the customer acquisition, the leads, the marketing, you've spent money getting all that in order, and now you're ending up with no client retention. And you're just, there's just more and more and more clients coming in the door, which means ultimately you're probably going to end up with a bad reputation. The more clients you see when you're not good at your job, it's not a good thing. It's actually a bad thing. So fix the product first to make that world class first or good. I won't even say world class, make that good enough first before you start uh, messing around with other things. But the end goal is to make all of it world class. We will be doing that over the next six to 12 months where everything is super polished and then we can just continue to iterate on that. So that's my answer there. Uh, It is a broad answer, but it was a broad question as well. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, So I think that's the podcast for today, episode 101 in the books. Again, please actually do this. If I was listening to a podcast and someone said, like, leave a comment, make sure you subscribe. Actually, do make sure you subscribe on YouTube or Spotify or whatever. But if I was listening to a, a podcast and someone said that, I wouldn't listen either. I wouldn't do it. Maybe I would do it. I've subscribed to one or two. Uh, maybe I would. Maybe I wouldn't. But I'm asking you. I'm saying, 
don't just ignore me when I say this. Actually subscribe. Actually leave a comment on YouTube. Ask me what you'd like me to talk about next time. The more of those we get, the more, the better, genuinely the better the podcast is because I get better questions, more questions, more content, which means I'll do more podcasts. There's nothing worse than me having to like look for questions and then being like, mm, that one's not great. That one's not great. Like ask the questions. I'll answer them. It makes it easier for me to do the podcast and hopefully you enjoy them more. Last thing. Our products, lower body basics, number one, that's where I start with all my hip, my knee, my hamstring, my quad clients, my pelvis clients, anything around there, groins. Uh, Lower body basics two, just a progression on from lower body basics one. Some people love lower body basics one. When I say some people, I mean everyone. And then they progress on to LBB two and they just see the kind of the next phase. Um, Foot, ankle and Achilles, where I go with all my foot, my plantar fascia, my big toe clients, because there's a big toe section in there, Um, ankle, dorsiflexion, calf, Achilles, shins, anything lower leg, foot, ankle and Achilles program, Um, upper body basics, anything wrist, elbow, shoulder, scapula, thoracic spine, and there's a bonus next section. This shows you kind of like where I start with my clients like I'd love them to be able to do all of these type of movements and this is how I start to load them and uh, cue them and all of that stuff those programs show you that start there the other one then if you've got those or some of those DGR interactive the feedback for DGR interactive is getting better and better and better as time goes on which I wasn't sure it would but it actually is getting so good the amount of messages I'm getting about it now there's so much content up there but I've started to organize it in a better way which is like just start with the biomecha- biomechanics 101 course. It gives you a few bits from each of the different areas of the site, the key bits that you need to start with. Um, so there's so much good content up there now, and there's a thousand coaches and therapists hammering that for 10, 15, 20 minutes a week. Um, so that's all our stuff. Share the podcast, like it, drop a comment, um, or do none of the above. Up to you. But either way, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll chat to you guys next time on episode 102.